As advertised, I'm Chris Wiggins, and I am splitting my time between Columbia and the New York Times, where I'm the chief data scientist. Uh, so to start, I'd like to offer a huge thanks to the invitation to be here, which is an opportunity to thank the SciPy community. So um, the things that I'll talk about today are all built uh, almost exclusively on the SciPy stack, uh, both at Columbia and at the New York Times. Uh, and in fact, uh, to prepare for this talk, I started looking over the prior keynotes, in, including the current keynotes, and, and got very depressed uh, looking at you know, the people who had brought us you know, IPython and, and SciPy and NumPy and even Guido who gave us Python. So um, instead I started procrastinating and we all know that the best way to start procrastinating is to do command line data hacks. So uh, I went to the folder where I keep all the collaborative GitHub repos for the New York Times and I was wondering how much Python are we using and, and which, which um, packages are we actually using most? So I uh, wrote some command line series of pipes and just f pulled out all the Python files and then extracted the word import and then uh, sorted it so I could see this is a great way to kill time. If, you're, if you ever really don't want to write a talk, you can just do command line data hacking. And in fact, I made it easy for you. I, I made a little URL if you want to do it right now. You can take your favorite series of repos and figure out what are the um, Python packages you're using most. And, and you can see that we use a lot of NumPy, just going back to general things, we use a lot of NumPy, uh, we use a lot of uh, Bayesian non-parametric learning, a lot of scikit-learn, and um, SciPy more generally. Pandas, uh, Mr. Job is for MapReduce, and some unit testing. So we use a lot of, of the SciPy stack at the New York Times. Uh, and in fact, this doesn't represent the amount that we use uh, IPython notebooks. I, I, before, I didn't realize Fernando wouldn't be here, otherwise I wouldn't have talked about this, but um, we use a lot of IPython notebooks. So just looking through my collaborative folder, you know, how many IPython notebooks are there? There's 156 IPython notebooks that I'm sharing under these GitHub repos. So um, in short, SciPy has made a huge impact on things we do and that I'm going to talk about today at the New York Times. And it's not just at the New York Times, as I mentioned, I also split my time between the New York Times and Columbia. At Columbia, because of the SciPy stack, we're able to go from basically from zero to SVM in a few weeks in the classes that I teach. So I taught a class for journalists last year, uh, basically data science for journalists uh, class. And journalists, as you imagine, are not always coming from strong Python backgrounds. So uh, it was very useful to have the whole notebook environment and, and to be able to leverage scikit-learn, which is, of course, built on top of SciPy and NumPy and everything else. Uh, so it's a huge thanks. And we also use NetworkX. I'm happy to see Eric is here. We taught some network analysis as well. So, um, so a huge thanks to the SciPy community. And I thought I would start by saying a little bit about how it came to pass that I I'm spending time at the New York Times, which is not something I would have predicted two years ago. Um, my background is actually coming from biology. So for the last 20 years or so, I've been working on, let's call it modeling in biology. And I've always been interested in biology as a complex system and how do we go about applying any sort of quantitative modeling to biology. And the way that we were doing this when I started my PhD in the early 90s was very different than the way biology related to modeling by the end of my PhD. Uh, and part of what happened was, actually 20 years ago this summer, uh, I remember I was having lunch with some other graduate students and one of them walked in holding Science Magazine. And this image was the cover of Science Magazine this month, uh, that month. It's the first freely living organism to have its genome sequenced. This is, the, this is a rendering of the genome of Haemophilus influenzae, which was first identified in the 19th century using pretty much the primary modality of biology for centuries, which is looking at stuff and turning, turning things blue when you pour some bad drugs on it. And uh, that's sort of, when I started my PhD in the early 90s, you know, doing modeling in biology, for most biologists, was sort of entertaining as long as it didn't distract them from proper bench work. And then by the time I finished my PhD, they were, as we now put it, awash in data. And the relationship between data and the sciences was changing rapidly in that field. And that caused a lot of pain. There was a lot of existential pain, like what is the scientific method? And do I have to write hypotheses in order to get funded by the NIH? And uh, other questions that um, were really interesting. And 
what I've seen over the last 20 years is those, those pains, that common sort of type of pain you get when you suddenly find yourself awash in data and you have no sort of fundamental model to compare it to because in this case you simply have you know, multiple phone books worth of information about this critter written in a language that you didn't choose, right? It's all ACGT, GCAT, Gattaca, Tagacat. By the way, phone books are these big yellow things we used to have that <laughs> had phone numbers in it. So it was a useful analogy 20 years ago. Um, but the whole relationship between biology and numbers really changed in a way that I think you saw in you know, social science and in other fields of the sciences and now I will argue in publishing. So actually many of the things that I'm now doing at the New York Times leverage the sorts of common pains that we now call data science in different fields. So I like to think of data science as sort of the intersection of that pain in different fields when you suddenly find yourself awash in data. And, and it's still real. In fact, yesterday there was this uh, story in Nature saying genome researchers raise alarm over big data. Storing and processing genome data will exceed computing challenges of running YouTube and Twitter, biologists warned yesterday. So, you know, unlike 20 years ago when data and modeling was sort of like entertaining but kind of distracting in biology, now it is like a central problem. How do we make sense of a complex world, not in the sense of complex modeling from, you know, simple systems that give rise to complex behavior? We have abundant data about our complex world. How do we make sense of that and learn from it? And that, I think, is a common question which people are now calling data science. So um, rather than focusing on pain, a more optimistic definition of data science was put forward by uh, Drew Conway, who's a data scientist in New York City. Many of you may have seen this graph over the last five years with the idea that data science is sort of a new and optimistic intersection of ways of looking at the world. Uh, it combines uh, mathematical and statistical knowledge with, as he put it, hacking skills. And here he doesn't mean breaking into things, he means making the computer do your bidding. Uh, and that already has a name, that's machine learning. And then trying to apply machine learning as a method to problems from some domain. And most of my published literature for the last 10 years has been that, trying to apply machine learning methods to biological or scientific questions. A scientist, a natural scientist has a question, how do I reframe that question as a prediction task or as a machine learning task, build a model that's interpretable to the domain scientist, and then advance the scientific questions. And that, I think, is very much in common with what I'm trying to do at the New York Times. So um, the way this all came about was uh, via a sabbatical. Um, and I took a sabbatical from Columbia, finally, in the fall of 2013. And uh, I was talking to my colleague, Mark Hansen, who, um, who said, don't waste your sabbatical by going to another university or by going to a tech company because then you'll basically be doing the same thing. You should go to the New York Times. It will be weird. So <laughs> I did, and it is. Um, if you don't know the New York Times, the New York Times is a newspaper. Here's the first image of the New York Daily News from 1851. It is a very old company, uh, which begat the New York Times later. Uh, and in order to situate myself and my group within the New York Times, it's useful to think about the traditional way that people have organized a publishing business, which isn't a church into state. Church is where the, pe the keepers of the craft are. There's a craft of journalism, and the people who, who, who own that craft, who have mastered that craft, whose decisions are guided by news judgment, are on the church side, and everything else is state, or sometimes called the business side. So the things that you usually see are on the church side, so when, people, when I tell people I'm a chief data scientist there, they say, oh, that's awesome, I love the upshot. The upshot does this awesome data journalism. They are awesome, they are great, they do great data journalism, they strive for reproducibility, they have a GitHub repo. I'm not in that group. They're, they're very good at what they do. Um, they, they don't really need data science for what they do, or at least my group. Uh, sometimes people say, um, chief data scientist, that's awesome. New York Times has great interactive pieces and graphics. They do, that, that is a great graphics group. Steve Duenas runs a great team of people who really know what they're doing for graphics. They're awesome, they're, I'm not in that group. They're, they're, they're also on the church side. Um, I would say I'm solidly on the state side and what's interesting about church and state for publications is this, this has been sort of the dominant org chart for publications for the last, journalistic publications for the last centuries. For the next century, I think it's real clear that there's gonna be church, state, and engineering which powers both sides. So I'm in the engineering side. 
Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about how that came to be and about what our charge is. Now, why is engineering fundal, fundamental to publishing? Right, publishing was doing just fine 19th century till now. Why do they need engineering as sort of a separate piece of the org chart? Uh, it's because of the un unintended consequences of the World Wide Web. Technology in general is a great lesson every year in un unintended consequences. So one of them is uh, in January 22nd, which happens to be my birthday, 1996, the New York Times introduced a website. They reported on it in this quaint story with the, the now charming headline, the New York Times introduces a website. Um, and everything really changed then. In the same way that everything changed when you had uh, whole genome sequencing of critters, unintended consequences began once you start putting your media on the World Wide Web. And it's different from radio and television, as I'll make clear. Now, the New York Times sees lots of views every day, just like many properties, right? We get, you can go to nytco.com and you can see this dynamically refreshed page that gives, in my opinion, way too much information about um, what happens at the New York Times, how many people viewed in the last hour, how many people are subscribing to the print circulation, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, the background picture is actually an interactive art piece programmed in Python by my friend Mark Hansen. So the next time you're at the New York Times, you can go enjoy the fruits of your labor as the SciPy community for this interactive art piece. Um, why is the World Wide Web different from radio and television? Well, it's because you know, a radio is a passive device, right? You, you send it photons and it amplifies them, but it doesn't tell the sender what, what photons it got or how people enjoyed it, right? Digital interactions are different because every one of those, every time you point and click, that's a request. And that request is received by a server, and if the server so chooses, that server can record it and then create a log of it and then hand it over to data scientists to try to make sense of it. So I'm not breaking any NDA to show you. You can open up Chrome browser and go to the developer tools and go to the network tools, and you can see when you go to any website, what are the communications, that, what, are the, what is the conversation you're having with every website you go to, right? So when you go to some random page on the New York Times, you send your IP address, you send where you came from, you send your browser, you send your OS. Right? There's a lot of data, even if you haven't registered as a user, even if there's no cookies involved. Right, there's still all sorts of things that you're telling somebody about how you like to use their product. Right? And it behooves you, if you're the person making the product, to listen to your audience. But by the way, lest you think that the New York Times is the most technologically advanced company in the world, I assure you you're giving up far more information than this every time you go to Facebook or Google or anyone else, let alone in your mobile app. So you can enjoy that. Um, <laughs> So the traditional way we thought about the World Wide Web in 1996 was as our online presence, right? When a company put out a website, introduced a website in 96, that was the online presence and you sort of distributed your message through some new channel. And now companies realize that because of the data that they're constantly receiving, it's really much more of a microscope into the audience. And that's broadly construed the challenge that we're trying to, the reason you might want to create a data science group in a company that's trying to understand its audience. Uh, it is also, thanks to a couple of JavaScript hacks, an excellent opportunity as an experimental tool. Right? You can try out different things uh, and see how people respond. And you can also run it in real time as an optimization tool. So if you don't know if it's famously, if you don't know if you should be using a red button or a blue button, you could randomly choose which people see red and blue. In about 15 minutes, you'll probably know which one is the best. And rather than holding a meeting and deciding should be blue. You could just let JavaScript send the right button to the right people. Um, in any event, the New York Times is interested in data science not for academic reasons. And by academic here, I mean in the pejorative sense of useless. Like, um, <laughs> it, it, is a, it is a very challenging and exciting time in publishing. And that challenge is rendered pretty visually in this chart, which is a chart of advertising spend on newspapers for the last 70 years in the United States. So the primary business model for journalism, right? So there's the craft of journalism and there's the business of newspapering, and they have been united for the last 70 years under advertising. And that's worked out pretty well, right? You can see there was, well, let's zoom in on that. You know, uh, there's billions of dollars spent every year in advertising, and in the 90s, publications were doing pretty well. And then something happened in 2004 through 2010 where like 70% of, of the advertising spend on newspapers in the United States ended. And again, I see that as an undetected consequence of the World Wide Web. Right? There's this famous adage in, in, uh, in advertising, in advertising I know I'm wasting half my money, but I don't know which half. 
now we know which half, right? And, and people no longer choose to waste half of their money because they can track who's looking at what and how does that lead to engagement, how does that lead to money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's had unintended consequences for journalism as a thing. And in particular, I like to think about this quote from Steve Blank that if startup is a temporary organization in search of repeatable and scalable business model, and that means that every publisher is now a startup, whether you're a venture-backed publication like BuzzFeed or a spin-off like Recode or the New York Times or anybody else, everyone is trying to see for the next century or at least for the next decade, does there exist a scalable and repeatable business model that will protect journalism as a craft? We don't know yet. We're still doing that experiment. In fact, this is a challenge that's outlined um, pretty well in a report which is colloquially called the Innovation Report. This was a document written by journalists for journalists at the New York Times, which was uh, promptly leaked to BuzzFeed in the spring of 2014. So now it's all over the World Wide Web. You can check it out. It's a great document about how the New York Times, the newsroom people, the church people, think that we should respond to innovation and try to defend uh, journalism from bankruptcy. Um, and part of their charge was that, yes, there exists a, a separate uh, group within the future of journalism. It is engineering, and engineering should have a role in all of the functions of the business. And that also broadly construed is what I'm trying to do with the data science group, is to empower the, enti the, higher, the entirety of, um, of the New York Times using the data that we collect and that we gather. So uh, that's very high level. Let me speak a little bit more precisely about what we actually do in the New York Times data science group. Um, as I outlined using Drew's diagram, we try to take machine learning and use it as a field to answer questions from a particular domain. So it's useful to me to break up what we do in terms of different types of machine learning. Uh, I like to break up machine learning into three different types of learnings. Supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Uh, supervised learning means trying to make predictions about things, like, uh, for example, regression is a type of supervised learning. Unsupervised learning often means clustering things. You have many observations and you try to assign them to different groups one way or another. Uh, reinforcement learning uh, is usually done, um, well, for many decades it was done by robots that were trying to interact with their world and balance explore and exploit and try to maximize some sort of reward. With the move to digital, and by digital I mean um, when you run a company you have to make decisions every day. If your company is primarily a website, many of those decisions are in code. Now that that's the way most companies are run, there's an opportunity continually to explore, exploit, and improve in real time. And that field, that type of machine learning is called reinforcement learning. Uh, if you'd like to know more about this, I co-taught a class along with Jake Hoffman from Microsoft called Modeling Social Data uh, on this subject in the spring about different types of learning in the real world. Supervised learning. So, why might you want to do supervised learning if you are the New York Times? Well, the very first day of my sabbatical, I sent an email to my then boss and said, we really need to build a model that predicts which of our subscribers are gonna cancel their subscription. Which, from the perspective of somebody who had been trying to predict which genes were gonna go up and which genes were gonna go down, is not too crazy an idea. So um, one of the things that we try to do is we try to look at how people engage with our digital products uh, and how that can be correlated to the way, well, let's say, people subscribing to or canceling their subscription from their products, can that be correlated with the way they use the products? Why is that of interest? Well, if you're in marketing, you want to rescue those people who look like they're going to leave. If you're in product, you might learn something about how you could improve your product based on how people are engaging with the product. Um, if, you're, if you ever talk to a business person, they'll call this the funnel. I've, I've learned lots of interesting things the last few years. Um, but what we'd like to do is build models that are not only predictive, but also interpretable. And this is very much like what happens in machine learning applied to biology. So when I was able to tell various yeast biologists, I think this gene is gonna go up and that gene's gonna go down, they wanted to know why. You know, what are the sequence elements in the regulatory regions that control that gene, right? We're not so much interested in, I mean, the ability to predict is good because then you as the data scientist can sleep well at night knowing that you haven't published a random number generator. But for the biologists, they actually want to learn something. They want to answer some scientific question. So similarly, um, you know, we have product people, marketing people who want to understand, well, what is it about the way people engage with our product that helps us uh, change the product and helps people love the product more and, and maintain a sustained relationship? So I can't tell you about the particular covariates, but we have some super cool stuff, and we work really hard to make these models interpretable for the people that run the company. Um, another type of supervised learning we do is we try to predict um, 
what's a classic problem called the news vendor problem. How many copies of the newspaper should you send to store number 1066 in Washington, D.C. tomorrow? Right? Somebody's got to make that decision. And, and many companies that is made using a set of rules of thumb incorporated into AS400 machines running COBOL. So uh, there are ways to treat that in a, where, in a more data-driven way. So those are things that we're trying to work with. Uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunities for time series modeling here. We've leveraged uh, stats modeling as a package as well as all the other, um, as well as the entire SciPy stack, of course, to try to build better models for predicting how many copies of the paper should go everywhere. Super unsupervised learning is a way of gathering things into like elements. Um, as an example, uh, you might take the corpus of the New York Times and take all of the individual stories and say, can we cluster those stories into groups of stories? Or you might take the set of all readers and say, can we cluster these readers into groups of readers? And can we say something explanatory about the way different groups of people engage with different types of content? Uh, this is a Flask web app that was built on top of BNPy. It's Bayesian non-parametric methods uh, package. I urge you to check it out. Built by somebody in my group named Dale Kim. Um, so we do a lot of unsupervised learning as well. Um, reinforcement learning, I mentioned earlier. If you've ever heard business people talk about A-B tests, that is the word that people in business use for experiment. That is, you'd like to see how something that you can control affects something that you want. And so you randomly choose which people get variant A and which variant B. Usually what happens is then you hold a meeting and then everybody fights about whether we should do A or B. You can imagine just getting into that whole process and just letting the code choose which variant wins. So A-B testing has a big place in business. Netflix is a company that um, is pretty transparent about their usage of machine learning. You know, they, they have to advertise, so there's an advertisement saying that they want a data engineer for acquisition and retention. And they have this nice blog where they say things like, we actually showed that you can increase member retention just by doing an A-B test on different variants. If you want to run A-B testing in real time, uh, this is a method called multi iron bandits. Um, for reasons that are fun to read about, but I won't go into here. Uh, and you can now basically get multi iron bandits as a service through, face, uh, through Google or other vendors who are happy to do this for you. Uh, so we built our own bandits framework. Um, we working in concert with uh, software engineers who run the uh, recommendation engine team to try to learn from the data, you know, which of the various recommendation engine algorithms we're testing out might be the best ones. So those are examples of concrete things we do how do we work this into the process of a company? Because there's no point doing fancy math if all you're going to do is have it sit in a, a PowerPoint or in a repo that nobody calls. Right? You need to do something that actually integrates into the process of the company. So I tend to think about the way that people use data in a company as they try to exp do something exploratory, like trying to think through what might be a new marketing campaign, what might be a new product, something for which you might do some exploratory analysis, but you don't really have hard data yet about how people engage with the thing. Once you have people engaging with the thing, you have the opportunity to do the kind of supervised learning I talked about on observational data. So you just watch people in the wild use your product and try to figure out what is correlated with um, the things that you want. Uh, once you want to go from correlation to causation, you have to actually run experiments. And more and more real live companies are starting to think more experimentally, particularly since the web, or more generally code, is the way they interact with their customers. There's more opportunities to run experiments. And if you're going to run experiments, you could hold a meeting, or you could just run this thing in real time and optimize directly. And to my mind, the abstractions associated with that are unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Now, I've written it as though there's some sort of logical flow there, but of course, all of these things are completely feeding back on themselves, just like in science. Right? You do some experiment, it makes you question the world. Maybe you should have done a different experiment. Right? And so uh, the real world. The same rules apply right? when you go to the business world. You, there's, there's no magic about how you learn about complex systems from data. So that's a bit about why the New York Times wants data science and a bit about the things that we do there. One of the things that's been useful to me is to learn sort of general lessons about how you might instantiate a data science group at a company. Um, so to try to think through that more abstractly, I spent a long time reading about uh, large old bureaucracies last year. And some of the most useful reading was reading about the Pentagon. Uh, and which is a large old bureaucracy. And uh, I, I came across this quote from a United States Air Force colonel that if you really want anything to change in a culture, you need to have people, ideas, and things in that order. Meaning you need to have people at the top who have the right mindset and who are going to bless some sort of change in the way you do things. You need to have ideas so everybody's on the same page and that sort of promulgates through the organization. And at some point you're gonna have to buy or build the things. 
right? Most of my time I spend thinking about the things, but in terms of like imperialism and, and, and actually like having an effect on, on a community, it's useful to think about what needs to get done to have all these things come together. Briefly put, things, what do we do? Um, we try to build data prototypes. A picture is worth a thousand words, but an interactive web app instantiated in Flask is easily worth a thousand pictures. If you want somebody to interact with, to, to interpret your machine learning or your general data science, it's hugely useful to stand up a simple Flask app and have people interact with a method and try to explore what they're learning as you vary uh, all of the various subjective design choices you made in your model. We build APIs. We try to build actual technology that other engineers can call so that we become part of the infrastructure of the company. And we try to impact roadmaps. And by this, this is a business word for plans for the next three months are called your roadmap. Right? And if we, if, we ch if we convince another group in the company that they should change their plans for the next three months, then we feel like we've made an impact on the company. We feel like we've done something to help uh, save, save journalism. Uh, data prototypes, if you want to see more examples of that, again, Dale Kim's website in my group is a good example of, of building simple Flask-based web apps that um, interact with content. Um, APIs, we instantiate in, in Python. Here's a Puppet script. Our Puppet scripts, if you open them up, you would see a lot of Python, uh, scikit-learn, and the rest of the stack. Roadmaps means the ability to change other people's decisions. Those people are trying to make decisions about what they're going to do, and we're, if we're able to convince marketing team or product team that they should do a new experiment or change their marketing campaign, then we know that we've had an impact. Uh, in terms of ideas, we've tried to promulgate a, a vocabulary around data science and how it relates to other sort of what were vague concepts around data. You know, we've tried to promulgate this idea that data science is distinct from data engineering and relies on data engineering. We need somebody to do good data warehousing to, uh, to build the pipes, so to speak, so that we can build a fountain. Um, and most important among the concepts we've been pushing are these idea of data embeds. Many members of the data science team at the New York Times are embedded in other groups. We try to maintain a centralized center of excellence, so it's useful for recruiting and training and setting a high bar for data science, but we want liberally to embed those, those people and other teams. So in the newsroom, in the international expansion team, uh, in the recommendation engine team, and all these groups, we try to make sure that there's somebody from our group who's contributing to their goals. But all of these things, uh, like I said, ideas, things, they're not going to be useful unless you have some people. And fortunately, there have been people in senior management who have, been who, have been, who have had the insight to recognize that data science is a complementary to, distinct from, but closely related to business analytics as it's been done in most companies for the last 50 years, and that we can understand our customers better by really learning from the data that we produce. Uh, so in summary, to instantiate a data science group, it's very useful to have people, ideas, and things in that order. Now then, um, I should say a bit about who did all the work. I've followed um, an academic tradition which Chris Moore introduced me to, that is, when I say I, I mean we, and when I say we, I mean they, uh, the people in, in the data science group, um, who have been working on the, um, the print logistics that I talked about, the unsupervised learning that I talked about, um, some of the people in this shot are working on super awesome things in the newsroom that are not ready for public yet, um, but there's some great projects working on, um, which brings me back to thanking you. Um, you know, these people are coming from fields as diverse as astrophysics and ad tech, and we all come together with the lingua franca, which is Python. So, you know, wherever these people are coming from, they're coming from a background where they've been using Python and mostly SciPy to get done what they've wanted to do. Uh, and if it weren't for that, for that lingua franca, we wouldn't be able to onboard, we wouldn't be able to pair program, we wouldn't be able to build all the things that we need to build to get this done. Uh, so I'd like to close by just thanks, thanking you again in person to the SciPy community for everything you've done to make my work at Columbia and at the New York Times possible. Thanks. <laughs> do we have time? Great, so I think we, had, we do have time for any questions. Please. Yeah. And also, what are the differences between what they were doing and, and what, they're, what they're doing now? 
Uh -huh. Those are very astute questions, which are all relevant to people, which makes them very difficult to answer. So um, the first one's kind of easy to answer. When I was, I did my sabbatical as part of the BI team. So I was embedded in the BI team, which had been, which was pretty new at the New York Times. They only created a unified BI, BI team in 2012, right? And the idea from the, the then CIO was, we should not only warehouse the data, we should learn from the data we warehouse. And that has many functions in addition to being good for the company, it's also good for QA on the data warehousing, right? Because when you're doing a statistical analysis, you often uncover some really fascinating data pathologies. So when you really put, make a statistical model on top of data, you really learn about how the data were constructed. It's also very useful to sit only a couple of meters away from the people who are doing the data warehousing so that they can say to you, oh, February 2013, <laughs> just don't use that data set. Um, <laughs> So that, that saves you a lot of time as a data scientist. Um, how, it, how it relates to, there, was, there certainly has been analytics and reporting uh, traditionally as a marketing function. There was not a lot of applications or any I know of machine learning applied to business problems. So um, th things like you know, building a multivariate model for hundreds of covariates to figure out at an individual level sort of micro-targeting which users were likely to churn, that, that was not happening. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities to apply, I mean, just like moving into biology. There's lots of ideas to apply, lots of opportunities to apply good ideas from applied computational multivariate statistics uh, to real world problems there. But in terms of getting along with the BI team, that was easy because I was in the BI team, so. Yeah, um, we could, but we're not. Um, I, I mean, I've had lots of, so, um, I don't know. A good example, Dave Bly is a friend and collaborator of mine at Columbia, so he's been working for a long time on topic modelings from large corpora of text, including dynamic topic modelling. So he and I have talked about how fun it would be to do a model that has a little momentum in it and to try to learn, you know, based on news last month, news this month, could you say something about which things seem to be on the uptick? Um, we haven't done that for a variety of reasons. One. I want not to do researchy things. I, I, you know, I, I feel like the, the group will be useful to the company if we can always put some sort of l connected line between whatever code we're writing and dollars. I want to be able to, to show that we're doing things that are actually useful to the company. And I haven't been able to find a way in which doing something like that would actually be a business use case. The other is that you know, in terms of church and state, I try not to do anything that anybody might interpret as violating the church side. So I mean, like the church side is friends of mine. We have people embedded in the newsroom. We try to do things that are that are uh, enhancing to rather than causing dissonance to the craft of journalism and to news judgment. And and I believe like it's good business for the New York Times to protect news judgment as a thing. And like the most important decisions the company makes every day are, are the decisions for which news judgment are relevant. However, the remaining 99% of decisions that the company has to make every day. A lot of those decisions are one for which we can bring data to the table to help them make those decisions. So we could, we've talked about it, haven't done that. Uh, should I choose or you choose? Please. Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 In fact, I took out that slide this morning, but I had a slide about the Facebook study where they showed that they could make you sad. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, the response to that kerfuffle by many people on the business side was people have been doing A-B testing ever since one day they put, you know, diapers above beer, and then the next day they put beer above diapers. I mean, you, learning from your users is done via experiment, which in business is called A-B testing. So. We want to do that all the time. We don't want to make products people don't like. Right? So we have to do A-B testing all the time. Um, it gets back to the, my response earlier, which is we don't do experimentation around, say, the content of the stories. Right? And, and, and again, I think that's for good business judgment. Once we start optimizing content, when we start, once we start applying algorithms to the things for which the craft of journalism is relevant and news judgment is relevant, there's no moat between us and anybody else who's got a website and, and good data scientists, right? It's, it's a far better idea for the company and it just keeps everybody happier and doesn't cause any issues if we protect news judgment and try to optimize things other than that. 
So uh, that's one of the many conversations. I mean, there's conversations all the time at the New York Times about personalization, news judgment, optimization. So, so yeah, that is certainly on people on the forefront of people's minds. And it's not just sort of a you know, abstract principle things. So again, I, I do think it's good business for the New York Times to, to maintain news judgment as, um, as something they cultivate and defend. The most enthusiastic hand waving in the back, so we should probably call. I'm definitely not aware of anyone who's continuously, continuously monitoring that. However, exploiting government data is a whole field. So there's this whole field called computer-assisted reporting, which has been around long before the phrase data journalism, which is taking data sets, often publicly available data sets, and finding the story within them. So one of the things that my, my group has done was to collaborate with, um, with somebody on the newsroom side who was taking government data about um, fatalities from automobile accidents, wrote a lot of Python, munged a bunch of government data in formats that were just horrible, you know, like shrink wrap equivalent to like unlock the value in them was difficult. Uh, found a bunch of um, fatalities that were potentially of interest for the reporter's perspective, and that led to a series of stories that led to the recall of a bunch of airbags. So we certainly do computer assisted reporting availing ourselves of many data sets, including government data sets, but I'm not aware of anyone who's written you know, a cron job or something to check and see how are these data sets are changing. I assume that now that the government has sort of a data, uh, well, a data scientist, if nothing else, that will be easier and easier to do. Do we have time? Please. Yes? Uh, I'm mostly, I'm concerned with, oh sorry, he's asking to what extent are my concerns, which is a personal question rather than a Python question, around the New York Times rather than the craft of journalism. Uh, I would say that my principal concern is around journalism and even more so democracy. You know, Jefferson has this great, great quote that if he could choose between a functioning government and a dysfunctional press or a functioning press and a dysfunctional government, he would choose to have the functioning press. So um, I do think that the craft of journalism is important and should be defended, and, and somebody needs to do the experiment to figure out what is the business model that will sustain it. Um, I certainly know the New York Times best. That said, a former student of mine is the former chief data scientist at BuzzFeed, who was recently bought by Condé Nast. I'm also friends with the chief data officer at Time Inc. Um, and chief data scientist at Washington Post, or not Washington Post, uh, Fox, not, uh, News Corp. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, that's, why, that's why I can say safely that it is a common question, is how do we leverage data in order to craft a sustainable business model for journalism? I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned with like, the future of journalism. It's just the New York Times happens to be the company that I know best and pretty real good at journalism. Okay, thanks very much. Thank